you've all heard of Sambit Coleman's range of silent tools. Well, I've travelled to Mazak today here in Worcester and we're going to find out much more about the latest innovation, which is the Silent Tool Plus range of intelligent tooling. Mateus, this Silent Tools Plus system, it's unbelievable. Can you briefly tell us what it is and how it works? Um, yeah, the Silent Tools Plus is our latest development within the Silent Tools. Uh, the Plus signifies that we're in the Quora Plus environment of uh, Sunway Coromant and we've added sensors to the tool to give added process insight and intelligence. Um, but here we're also talking about a very long bar, which is uh, sort of the Formula One of bars where we're optimizing every single part of the bar from the damping system to the materials used within uh, and stretching as far as we can go. Also building on the last year's uh, dynamic uh, development of, uh, of silent tools, understanding the bars better. Traditionally, a bar this size, this diameter, it would take a, a long time to set. Have you overcome this issue? Yeah, for a big, heavy, long, boring bar, you still need to get the center line on point. Uh, and so for this, we're using the sensors. As you can see on the screen here, we have a dial showing the actual position of the bar. I've entered the target angle of 90 degrees, which is for this Masek machine. And during setup earlier, we were able to just rotate the tool until we got a green light on the screen. So we could just, uh, you know, shift it around a bit and uh, we could quickly see when we were on point. Okay, so the tool is set, we're actually now in cut, so what, right. what's taking place? Uh, so right now we're machining a semi-finishing cut, a uh, two millimeter radial depth of cut and 0.25 feet, mm -hmm. semi-finishing. And as we can see now from the sensors, which are streaming via Bluetooth, uh, we can see that we're in cut. This might seem obvious, but for a big long bar inside a closed door machine with coolant doing small cuts, you don't really know if you're machining air or not. We can see we have a very steady load at about 25%, 26% of the maximum of the bar. We have a radial deflection of 0 0.23 millimeters, which is very interesting for the operator to know because then you'll know sort of what he has to compensate in the next cut. Um, yeah, I guess 0 0.23 in a component this size, it's not the end of the world, but maybe this could be up to two, two meters in length, maybe more. Exactly, and you might uh, get tool wear and other factors that might change the, the deflection throughout, inclusions in the material, um, so yeah, it's quite interesting to see how that develops. The load of 26%, what's that telling us? I know obviously the load is 26%, but can we push it harder? Is that where it needs to be? Exactly, so this gives the option to push the bar harder. So the bar will deflect because it's a long bar, but sometimes uh, I think we think that the customers can push the bar harder and increase the productivity by increasing the load. And also seeing abrupt changes to the load should alert the operator that something's going on that might not be supposed to be happening. Um, and I see a temperature, 31 degrees. If, yeah. that, if that increases, what does the, what does the process do? Um, so right now, if the temperature increases, we'll get some alerts in the software uh, telling the operator to either turn on coolant or let the bar rest because we might lose functionality of the damping system mm -hmm. if something wrong happens. Mm -hmm. And right now we're machining without coolant, so you can see it is increasing a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So I understand how it communicates with a tablet or a PC, but how is it communicating with the machine tool to influence the machine tool? Exactly, I guess that's the new part here. Um, San McCormick has developed a, a sort of a data exchange interface towards the machine control system, which allows us to partner with uh, Masek, for example, and, and work together to be able to rapidly share process data between the tool and the machine control system to perform timely uh, emergency stops or even adaptive control as we continue to develop the solution. What we have done here is implement a Bluetooth antenna to talk to the bar and then we take that into a device sitting in the machine running the software, which is then further connected to the actual control system of the machine. What happens if I'm not lucky enough to have a control as sophisticated as this? Uh, it's a possibility to connect directly to the bar uh, with an external tablet, with any tablet that supports uh, uh, Bluetooth. Okay, and we're interested to learn, when we're producing bores, surface finish is critical. How do we measure this? Um, using the same sensors actually that we did the tool setup with, um, in the Silent Tools Plus we have vibration sensors that we use both to monitor chatter vibrations, but also sort of the actual motion of the insert over the surface, so we can give an, a ballpark estimate of sort of where you are in surface roughness. And we can see this bar over here is called roughness uh, and it will quickly show us whether we're doing a roughing cut or finishing cut and to an operator running this he will 
after a few cuts, he will know where he's supposed to be for process, and he can pick up abnormalities just from looking at this view. So are we saying we know you don't need an operator to be present by the machine tool? Because I'm presuming we, as the load increases, we get insert wear. Does this, does this put more load? The load can increase from uh, insert uh, damage or wear, um, or wrong programming, or wrong setups, wrong tool offsets. There are so many parameters that can lead to uncertainties in the process. So the, the GUI from the software is meant to increase the knowledge of the operator. But in this case, we're also tying into the machine control systems that we can do rapid actions uh, much faster than any operator could do, which also allows the operator with more confidence to leave the machine during long bores. What would happen in the unlikely event of an insert failure? For this setup right now, we have uh, two sort of safety nets. The one, if, if the vibrations increases, as they would in the insert breakage, then we will stop the process and safely retract the bar, and we'll know the position where we retracted from. Also, if so, we, so just on that process, yeah. do, do you need the operator to be present, or is that a, is no, that a macro? That's a, that's an automatically triggered macro. So we send a signal from a software through the interface into the machine, and within you know milliseconds we're initiating a stop and retract macro and that's for the the high vibration but also if the load go above a certain level acceptable by the user we can look at the settings page here the operator can actually himself decide for finishing process maybe 10 percent is a good maximum load because you're running at five percent so you don't want it to be increasing too much whereas if you're running a roughing cut you might be at you know 80 mm. 80 something percent so you can, the user can themselves set this. Also, every process is different, materials and cutting parameters, inserts and so on. So the user can also decide and adapt the GUI to fit their process so that they can set their own acceptable level for vibration. Maybe they can accept a bit more than somebody else or a bit less depending on the process. So it's quite customizable. And if this component was to come off and maybe the surface finish wasn't great, it's gone into quality and it's been it's, it's been brought back for rework. Right. Is there any way we can retrace all this data to find out what, what the issue was? Yeah, that's our current work right now, actually, because we see now that we're generating good data. We see the, the value of this, both as a documentation to the end customer, as an additional aid to the, the measurement and quality departments to know where in a cut did we have vibrations or where did we have the worst surface so they can check off the worst area. So right now we're working with storing this data, generating reports, making them available po post fact. So we're going to launch that in not too long. Uh, and that's really exciting. Digital twin, we're talking about digital twins of machines, for, but for very expensive aerospace components, you could think digital twins of the component themselves, where you have a digital history of the machining process. So would it be a fair comment to say, as, as you collect more data, this product is only going to get better? That's true. We're, we're building data sets that we can use to further analyze and develop new algorithms. Uh, and also, when we have the good sensor data in place and also a good collaboration with Masak and the platform to talk to the machine, the sky's the limit with what we can do. We could you know, look into more adaptive controls and we think we're taking a big step towards autonomous uh, long bores. And that, that, that's the ultimate goal, to be able to leave the machine and do completely autonomous machining. From a commercial perspective, what types of companies do you see buying this type of technology? I think initially, first out, would be anybody who's running really expensive components. Uh, you, if scrap is really critical, then you want the extra process security. And also we see these industries such as oil, oil and gas with difficult materials and aerospace. Because of the, the process security they need, they're running very defensively. So we think they also can up their productivity in addition to increasing the process stability and protection from this type of system. So we're, we're looking for high-end, high-cost components to start out with, and then obviously as the technology develops, it'll be more widely available on smaller bars and for different processes. So this is another roughing cycle. What, what data are we running at? Now we're doing a bit rougher cut. We're changed to a 08 insert. We're doing a three millimeter on the radius on the AP and we're doing 0.25 feet. So it should get us a bit higher loads. And then during, during this cut, we want to show the overload protection that we have. So at some point during the cut, we're going to increase the feed abruptly to create, sort of simulate the overload or a collision or hitting a, hitting a face or some extra material inside. Let's give it a go. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we can see we're in cut now. 
we're around 26 percent point three deflection it was quite significant actually so for the demo i'm going to go to the settings page i'm going to change the maximum load to let's say 30 and now if i increase the, the feed we can so the machine stopped and protected the bar and component and retracted so that's this dro dropping down and coming out into a, a safe environment exactly we have a macro that is triggered within milliseconds seconds after detecting the overload uh, and since the operator can set his own overloads, you could adapt this to a finishing pass or to a roughing pass, depending on your own process. I guess that's important because quite obviously a roughing cycle is going to generate far more force uh, and, and deflection and things like this and load than, than the finishing exactly. cycle. Yeah, every process is different and in some critical operations, you might 10% load might be way over what you can have and, and in other, you might be pushing the bar to the maximum. So Mateus, this is a finishing pass. What is the data? The data for this finishing pass is one millimeter on the AP. We're still a 08 insert to provoke the bar, uh, and we have 0 0.15 feed. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do now is to provoke some chatter. We're going to go down on the feed to a very low, ridiculously low feed for the insert and try to provoke some chatter, vibrations. Uh, and this will simulate a scenario that could be because of a broken insert, uh, clamping that's been weak too weak or other issues in the setup of the bar. Um, and then we're going to see that if we go above a certain threshold, then the machine will stop the process and abort and retract the tool again to make sure everything is safe. So let's start the process. And uh, during the process, I will go down on the feed to try to provoke some vibrations. Okay, so we're in cut now, as we can see, we're down to 7% load, which is quite a small cut, and we're at 0 0.18 in deflection, still on the finishing cut. Now to try to provoke, I'm gonna enable the functionality, so we have high vibration machine stop turned on, and then I'll go down on the feed. And here we can see the vibration rising, and there we have the machine stopped and retracting. Okay, so what we're trying to replicate there, like you say, is an insert failure, probably not a failure, but maybe a significant wear. Yeah, high vibrations that are unexpected might arise from uh, insert damage or insert breakage, wear. Um, component moving. Exactly, loose component, loose bar, bad clampings, and incorrect offsets of the tool could also be a problem. So this essentially, it's like a seatbelt for the, for the bowing bar, isn't it? It's a safety net. Exactly, so the same as for the overload. We really want to protect the bar, the component, and even the machine to make sure we don't get in a situation that will break either one of the three. So would you say Sandvik Corman to the world leaders in tool-based intelligence? I think at the moment, Sandvik Corman has taken a lead in, in the, the tool-based intelligence. Um, and for us, uh, working together with Masak, this is a starting point. Now we have the technological platform to use this tool-based intelligence and data to interact with the machine. So from now on, we can start developing those customer values and increase the automation and integration possibilities. So you're just getting started, really? In one way, this is a pretty exciting start, yes.